Well, today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to talk about some of our favorite videos of all time. Now, each one of us has picked our favorite video, and we'll go through and tell you what we think about it, and we'll discuss it. Greg, why don't you tell us about what the plan is here? Yeah, really simply, we have been doing this for three and a half years, and we have some great videos that we have, each one of us has loved this or that, and we've picked our number three, our number two, our number one. We'll start off with number three. We'll tell you why we like it, and then we'll discuss it, and then we'll play a clip. Mark, why don't, why don't you go first? We'll just go right around the little circle there. Mark, what's your third favorite? Okay, third favorite, and I know, uh, Scott, we collided a little bit on that, which makes me feel good. Makes me feel good yeah. that, you know, I'm not a loner out, out there enjoying this character. Guy called Nicholas Rossi. Do you all remember Nicholas Rossi? This is the guy who kind oh, of yeah. disguised himself up like Billy Bunter, who was a, a um or a bit like, you know, a Prime Minister Boris Johnson. Essentially, what interests me about this is uh, you can't even get past lying if you disguise yourself as somebody else, take on different names, put on a fake accent. He even covers his face with an oxygen mask, so he pretends to have an, an illness as well. Uh, I believe that's what they call psychologically malingering. And, um, <laughs> and, and he gets himself into a new relationship, and he's trying to escape, essentially, being extradited to the US where he's um, charged with some pretty serious crimes. So I just love this because of the comic nature of it and the disguises he puts on and, and why he thinks we can't just see past this immediately. I have no idea. He's a he's an utter clown. Uh, Chase, do you remember this 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 guy? Is, is he in your memory somewhere? Yeah. <clears throat> and the name you call that a name, Billy Bunter. Billy Bunter. Was. <laughs> and we Googled that in the episode, and that was incredible. What I loved about it was the layers of not lying, but the layers of deception. And deception and lying are different things. And it was like a mask covering up a person with a fake name, pretending to be another person, pretending to be another citizen with a fake accent, also pretending not to have committed all these crimes, and then lying about the entire thing. That's the deepest, like onion that i've ever seen it, even outside the panel all the videos i've ever looked at that's the most layers of deception i've ever seen great it's like a squirrel trying to be a turtle trying to be a duck pretending to be um a person or something right. you know, or something it's bailing at all of it chase chase yeah. my choice of vegetables is different from yours i think he's a potato like mr potato head because he right. kept adding little things like we couldn't see through it and every one of us has had a mr potato head we know that under there's this big old potato and this guy was one of the worst liars we've ever seen he found more things he falls down can't get up all kinds of crazy things just to make us believe it, because his wife is there to rescue him. I would have liked to have seen, you know, Mr. Potato Head fall on the floor, and let's see how he gets up from there. But, yeah, it was to me, this is one of the wacky ones, too. So, Mark, thanks for choosing that one. Scott, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, the thing I liked about it, and the reason I chose it, was because we're seeing someone trying to preserve their ego as they're trying to preserve their freedom. So he's doing two things here at the same <laughs> time. Because this, I think this cat is already in the, already in the hole now. He's in the pokey now. I think so. Yeah, he's being yeah. extradited to the U.S. last I heard. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just funny seeing him do that. It's literally looks like Mark was saying, like a clown, like somebody doing a bit, like a Saturday Night Live bit or something when they're making fun of somebody. It looks so over the top that it's it's incredible. It's a, it's just hilar hilarious. And everything out of his mouth, of course, has to be a lie, has to be, you know, it's deceptive. Because he's trying to protect this thing, the turtle behind the squirrel, behind the clown, you know? So that's what I thought was the funniest, the, my third favorite one. Nicholas Rossi, also known as Aliverdian, is believed to have used at least 16 different aliases. 16 aliases? No, typos. These are very serious charges that this man faces. They claim this man faked his own death to evade no. those charges. Did you fake your own death? I'm... Uh, uh, Jared, I, we're sitting having a conversation. I've never been dead to anyone. After so many years, I know him inside out. I know my husband does not have tendencies as a rapist. He is going to be needing a very 
large team on the pitch to try to say that I am a rapist because not only are we terrified because this is a vicious lie but we are also incredibly disgusted by the fact that we now have to live our lives in in a secretive way because my wife can't even walk down the pavement to get a pint of milk. And it continues. Some people will say you're you saying it a secretive you, you, way, but you're now speaking to various media outlets, including absolutely. us. Why? What is the purpose then of this interview? The truth needs to be known. All right, Chase, what do you think? Or what's your what's your third favorite one? I think my third favorite has to be just watching Amber Heard and the Amber Heard episodes. And it was just a perfect exposition of how somebody on camera is different than they are in real life. And it was just like a, a desire to be flawless. And it, I read a lot of philosophy, like a, probably too much. And the one guy in 1980 wrote a book. He's a French philosopher named Jean Baudrillard. And he wrote this book called Simulation and Simulacra. And Baudrillard argues in this book that in kind of a postmodern world, simulations what or what are representations of reality, like a fake thing at Disneyland, have totally replaced real. And that kind of led us to a world where distinction between real and representation is just blurred. And this episode was just that. So like Amber's behavior all over is this manifestation of this entire theory and it's where the simulated kind of online self becomes more significant than the authentic self and it just it, i think it highlights not just something about amber but our all of us as a society that we've kind of shifted towards valuing representations instead of realities that's uh, maybe a little too deep for a christmas episode but great what do you think yeah, no, I think it's a great example of knowing the thin veneer of the person that you're seeing, because if we pick a specific moment and we go back and look at her on the stand, my single favorite part of the thing you're talking about is she would turn her head almost like she's on a switch. When she turned to face the, the jury, boom, her face would turn to this, she turned her face back the other way, it would change immediately. That thin veneer, that simulation of some normal human. I think it's a beautiful example. I think a great, great choice for number three. Scott, what did you see? I thought it was awesome because we got to see somebody just the things she was talking about, like the parakeet floors. I mean, if, you, if you're, if you, this gives <laughs> Oprah Moral one time was talking about how you're not any smarter from once you have a million, a billion dollars than you are when you're, you know, what was it down at the end of the bar that it, you, you were, if you had a billion dollars or something, something just because you have a bunch of money doesn't mean you're, you're any smarter than you were before you got the bunch of money. Right. So this is one of those things where I, I, I think people similar to her, she and people similar to her, they, they come on like they're really smart. That's how they got to be where they are. It's how they got so much money. But we can tell by the way she talks and things she's concerned with and, and the things she thinks she's fooling people with, she's not as smart as she thinks she is. And on the other hand, you have uh, Johnny Depp when he came in. I mean, we, we learned some cold stuff from that guy, man. I mean, he said, you'll never see my eyes again. <laughs> and he's ever going to look her in the eyes again. That was, man, what do you think about that? That's pretty hardcore. If he's never going to look her in the eye again, ooh, that's so. Yeah, a lot of people say, well, he's crazy. He's this or that. Yeah, but he still knows who he is <clears throat> and where he comes from, apparently. So, but, and the thing about him, we saw that world where we wouldn't even think of doing some of the stuff this guy's doing. You know, that whole lifestyle, it was, I think it was seeing the lifestyles behind who they are. That was the most, that was the most interesting thing for me to see how those personalities live in those lifestyles. So, Mark, what do you think? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's worth noting that the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp episodes are the most watched, I believe, of any of our episodes. So people are obsessed with this couple and this kind of story, I think, because it holds what we call news value in that there's scandal involved and there's celebrity and celebrity at a royal level. So, you know, you panelists have not watched our royal episodes as much as you've watched the Johnny Depp, uh, Amber Heard episodes. They are essentially more royal than uh, royalty and we get fascinated by the idea that people highest up 
uh, in status, highest up in status, would have some of the same problems as us, but actually those problems are at a more extreme level. Um, maybe it's maybe it's uh, Schadenfreude. Uh, I always worry saying that word because <laughs> <laughs> I can kind of see it written up and think, am I going to pronounce that that one correctly? You'll be able to tell me in the comments uh, below. But but maybe we do uh, wallow and enjoy other people's misfortune and scandal uh, because it feels like some some scandals that we've got into in some way or problems we've got into but never that big never writ that large so yeah love uh Thank love you. that let's uh let's see on that, that point that's that's it shows us that we're we're are the creators and the consumers of deception in these digital era that we're living in and i think the harder we try to build a persona the more we lose our identity and there's no there's no two ways about that. The more I'm trying to project something, the less I get to know myself, the less I'm actually in my own identity. And that was just a crystal clear example because it showed the paradox between the two. One person who is openly like wore all of his flaws openly and the other person who pretended to have zero. Yeah, very much. Uh, if you go to my Facebook page, my private Facebook page, which some of you have access to and some of you don't. Uh, what's written below my name is never believe your own hype. Uh, and then a whole bunch don't of fall hype. Fall for your own press. Yep. <laughs> don't fall no. for your own press. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And he tells you, you will not see my eyes again, doesn't he? Uh, yes, he does in that recording. And he kept that promise, hasn't he? As far as I know, he cannot look at me. He won't look at you, right, Miss Heard? He can't. One of the first questions your counsel asked you on direct is, why are you here? Do you remember that? I do. Let's please play plaintiff exhibit 357A, which is already in evidence, Your Honor. And for the record, it's 2122 through 2140. And see what the, see what the jury and judge thinks. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell them, Johnny Depp. I, Johnny Depp, man, I'm, I'm a victim too, Mr. Yes. And I, you know, it's a fair fight. It's these probably people believe or side with you. That's your voice on that recording, right? Yes, it is. And you were speaking with Mr. Depp? Yes. And you said to Mr. Depp, quote, you can tell, you can please tell people that it was a fair fight and see what the jury and the judge think. Tell the world, Johnny. Tell them, Johnny Depp, I, Johnny Depp, a man, a victim too of domestic violence, end quote. That's what you said, right? I was saying it to the man who beat me up, yes. I thought it was preposterous. And the man you beat up numerous times. <laughs> right, Mr. I could never hurt Johnny. You're here in this courtroom because Mr. Depp finally told the world that he is a victim of domestic violence. I know that he is suing me um, and has sued other people or corporations that have said that as well. You didn't think he would tell the world he was a victim of domestic violence, did you? I found it hard to believe that he could or that he would do that considering the relationship he and I had. I, I thought it would be crazy for him to do so, knowing what I know we lived through. Or, as you said to him in that recording, who was going to believe that Johnny Depp, a man, is a victim of domestic violence, right? With all due respect, I wasn't saying it because he's a man. I was saying it because he's a man who beat me up for five years. Mr. Depp is your victim, isn't he? <sighs> no, ma'am. Okay, Greg. What about, what about your number three? Well, you know he has to be there, the Bigfoot story. The Bigfoot story comes in at number three for me because this guy swings for the fence. I'm going to call out one clip that I want you to watch. It's when he's driving to his doctor's appointment. This is much later. He's driving to his doctor's appointment with his wife, and he sees the female Bigfoot chick hanging out on the side of the road. That's This guy has swung for the fence so many times and gotten away with it, he just keeps going. Now, up to then, he had built up, he'd watched these things lie on their bellies and grab wild turkeys by the legs. Come on. The, 
But what's interesting is to watch the interviewers and watch him cascade from the very beginning, the ver- first interview. It looked believable. Everybody would say, wow, this guy looks believable. Then it gets a little less believable and a little less believable. And by the time we get to the last one, he's with people who are there to talk to him, who know the Bigfoot stories. And he's just fishing. I mean, he is telling fish stories all. I, I was. This is the one where I said, you can always tell an old bullshitter because that's what we're looking at. And I love the Willie story for that very reason, because if you'd only watched the single clip, you would have seen this might be believable. But once you get to that end, you see a whole a lot of something different. Scott, what do you think of Mr. Willie? I, I like that one because we saw somebody create an entire world, a civilization of Bigfoot feet. How you say it? Big feet, yeah. Going Big from feet. yeah, yeah. There's a um, um, a woman and a man, and they've got little. And he's got he's planning on hunting and stay, staying at. You know, I I thought that was incredible because. And you're right because he had sold that so many times. He's just he's like you said he's swinging for the fences. He's just creating stuff on the fly about things they do and don't do. Next thing you know, they'll be you know driving. They'll have invented. You know, it, it's they'll just. It'll go on and on and on like Well, they that. work out because one was bowed up, remember? Well, obviously, obviously. <laughs> I mean, how are they going to stay healthy if they don't? Yeah, Greg. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, well, look, we, we think alike on this because I, I love the Smurf village nature of it, that, he's, that he has created this, this world. You know, and any good storyteller needs to create a full world around something to be able to tell the lie. They've got to think, you know, outside of their own little box. Um, but he's, but it, it, but it does feel like the Smurfs to me. I mean, I would actually say he probably watched an episode of the Smurfs and was like, damn, that's like, like I should have invented that world for my, my Bigfoot characters. And, and he did, he just went ahead and did it. You know, he got, he got, you know, um, Bigfoot carpenter and Bigfoot, you know, cook and Bigfoot, you know, and, 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 and as you say, you know, uh, the, the, the female Smurf on the side of the road there as well. Uh, it's all there. It's all there. It's great fun. Uh, Chase, what do you remember of this one? Yeah, I remember us just looking at the behavior. So I always teach this concept of see suffering first. Because I want to understand, like, why does the story get made up? Uh, So is it made up out of desperation? Is it made up out of loneliness? Is it made up out of a fear of being insignificant? A fear of, I'm going to leave this earth, no one's going to remember who I am. I need to increase my level of significance. And I think that's what it was. And we could see that so clear in the episode. And when, you you know, I think body language is just an unedited manuscript of what's going on inside of our head. And we're seeing so much of that. And in, especially in the Bigfoot stories, when you see stuff like that, which was like the origin of the behavior panel, it took us a long time to do this. But we were, Greg initially is was obsessed with like we need to like bring these Bigfoot people in and interview them and interrogate Bigfoot people. Any conspiracy guys, but Bigfoot especially. He's been yeah. saying that for years. I mean, that's one of the first things we when we when he and I were talking about. I said, Dude, we should do a uh, try to do a TV show or something. He said, Oh, here's what we got to do. I was like, Do I know? And it made sense when he's telling it. it. Makes sense, you know? Like, yeah, because you'd bring that person in, you talk to him, and and. Basically, what you do is show them they didn't see Bigfoot, make them understand that's not what happened. But if you're dealing somebody like, with somebody like this guy, that that'd be well, tough. Uh, and, and sorry to interrupt that, but I, I didn't I didn't start by assuming that they hadn't seen something. I just wanted oh, to yeah. get a good example of how you can take a story apart. To your point, Chase, why did it generate? Could could be true. Don't know. Never never seen one. Don't don't know. I live in Georgia. There's a Bigfoot museum. I guess I should go. I think you've seen one. You're that was one where we, where we saw a lot of classic deception indicators. Oh, yeah. And I think that that really showed a difference in that episode of science kind of telling us how to look at stuff. But then experience tells us what to see and what we're actually seeing in that context and stuff. Matter of fact, uh, uh, from my house one morning, we were going to the doctor about 10 years ago. And uh, we were about uh, north of Keechai about two miles and there, there was this property it's it's open a big old piece of land on the left and uh i saw some crows I looked over my left and i saw some crows about uh mm-hmm. 70 80 feet from the fence line and 
you had some facing each other like that, northeast, and you had some facing like that, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, one of them, the crow that's on the east side, he turns and starts walking real brisk, aggressive uh, towards the east. And I'm like, what the heck? Well, there was a big uh, female standing there on the edge of the woods, mm -hmm. and she was real nasty. I mean, her hair, mud, I'll tell them why. I said, look, look. And she said, yeah. So we went in, uh, she told my daughter, she said, man, I saw a big one today. So your wife saw it. She saw it. She well, saw it. we were coming back through there. It wasn't two weeks ago. She said, "Look, there she is again." Right. Two weeks ago. Yeah. From now. Now. So she saw it again. Yeah. And this land, uh, these people uh, own it. It's a lot of land, and they're very wealthy people. They had a big yacht that sell around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to this lady. She wrote books. And uh, she said, you know, I don't know if I believe in Bigfoot, you know, and stuff like that. And she said, I, I hear panthers hollering at night and everything. I said, ma'am, I said, they can sound just like a panther crying. Right. So let's talk about our second favorite one. Let's go back around the other way. Greg, what was your second favorite video of all these? Yeah, so my second favorite one, I'll just go with this. I knew that he knew that I knew that he knew. That's my second favorite of all time. We had Dr. Phil on our show to talk about Mark Castellano, who had murdered his girlfriend and who was pretending like all things were good. The specific clip that's my all-time favorite is he's claiming to have these hard drives that he drove around with in his truck all the time. So Dr. Phil says, well, go get them. And he gets up like they're there, and he walks about eight steps and goes, uh and you can see it in his face. You can see sheer terror that he is busted, that he is now caught, that he's lied out loud to Dr. Phil on the show. And I think it's a great example. You know, he says it all the time. Nobody confesses in a crowd. Otherwise, that guy would have confessed right there. If that were an interrogation room, he had him right down to it. And it's a beautiful recognition because up till then, this Castellano guy is probably the closest we've all come to saying he's doing duper's delight with that half smile going the whole time and he had so much made up stuff for why everything happened that he'd use cheap cleaner and it it smell I and mean, there's a ton of stuff in here chase what about you what do you remember hey, hang on a second what about what where what show was it we were in the green room and we were watching dr phil on the on the monitor and he was talking to somebody <clears throat> and he had him right there man all he had to do is go like this and they would it would everything would have opened up but he let him go remember that we we're all in there screaming you got him you got him or her whoever it was who was it do you remember that we were sitting there in the I green room show maybe it was, it was if we were all there there were only a couple changed. of times well it could have been well, we've been there a few times. I think it's what you're talking about is with the um, woman who claimed she was Madeleine McCann. That's who you're talking about. No, it was Scott. You and me were sitting in the green room watching him really dig into the woman who was self-proclaimed uh, psychologist uh, on the show. And oh, that's him, right. That's right. That's right. I remember you talking because I thought it was guy. all of us. But yeah, so so it was me and you. I remember that. I remember when she went. Well, I can't. We can't. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I remember that now. But he had it right there. It's just the so same you guys show. Don't know. Yeah. We may have told you about it. Yeah, where he had this yeah. woman getting re just all he had to do was just a little a gentle shove, and she just fallen off the cliff. But he like held her by the back of the shirt and brought her back. You know what I mean? Chase was like, "Nah, there it is. You got it, man. Go!" And he boxed her in. I mean, he did it. He classic boxing. Just tick, 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 had her right in the corner, man, and but let her go. And we were like, "What? Yeah, that's right." And then he told us why. So. He, well, he did it in this. He had this guy right up against the wall. If you watch this clip, you'll see this guy's right up against the wall. Chase, what did you see in that? This was uh, here. This reminded me of America's Got Talent. <laughs> and so somebody comes up there and, you know, Simon Cowell is kind of a, a mean, kind of has a mean persona anyway. And they sing horribly. And Simon says, well, you haven't this was the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. And the contestants that are holding the microphone, they're like, my aunt loved it. My mom loves it. My friends all tell me I'm great. Everything I've ever done, everyone says I'm great. And Simon says, you have awful friends. You have a terrible family if they're just lying to you. And that's Castellanos. He's hanging around people that he can lie to and deceive yep. all of his life. And then he gets the shot at going big. And he doesn't know that there's a different environment out there with highly intelligent people. Scott? Yeah, I, and that's pretty much what I was going down. He's a little fish. 
he's a big fish and a really small yeah. pond of people he can just do all that to. And then when he gets when they say, oh, okay, I'm going to the show, man, I'm going to the big time. He goes out and gets in the in the big pond, you know, in the ocean. It's like, oh, whoops, wait just a minute. Because when you when you compare the the intellect he's going against normally or giving stuff to normally, and then you have a, a, a real person come in who is so is really smart, and there's no, you can't fight that. There's no way to and win a that. Psychologist and a that's, court guy and yeah, uh, that's and what you're I'm guilty. You can't you can't <laughs> fight that man. It's like that you know. It's like a little ant fighting an elephant or something. I mean, the elephant can sit there and, and goof around with you and play around with you. Go, isn't that adorable? Look at that little. Come here, a minute. Can everybody come over? Look at the little ant and that thing adorable. But he does. You know, that's what it was. That's what it was like. So it looked like to me. People so, don't realize the ethics of that. Of like if. Even if he was innocent, if Dr. Phil wanted him to confess or wanted him to look extremely guilty, he could do that very, very easily. Uh, just manipulating lighting and cameras and the situation oh, yeah. of him coming in, just setting everything up and priming that, uh, which goes back to why he didn't crush that that woman. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think in the, in this particular instance as yes. well, the show shows are the, the the kind of the the backstage of it. Yes. So, the, so in okay. the in the editing of it, uh, this show goes, "Hey, look, this person is being viewed by a lot of other people. There's cameras around. There's lights around. So we have to always understand that this isn't like a, a like a police interrogation whereby the person may well know right. there's a camera on them, but they're not expecting it to be broadcast across the nation. In this particular instance, that person is sitting there. They know that this is being brought going to be broadcast. They've signed up for that. They've signed a document that says you can do whatever you like with that. So that's always going to change that that person's performance because they they know they're definitely in a performance at, at that point at that point. And I think this show actually kind of goes, look, this is a performance of, of some sort and maybe instructs the, the audience. This is probably going as far as you can possibly go because this is public, not private what's going on here. So it's always good to kind of rem remember yeah. uh, that, you know, what would this interview be like if there was In no private, yep. there could be a yeah, whole, yeah. Different, whole different thing. When I asked him, when I asked Dr. Phil about that, he said, you can, he said, if you're not careful, you can crush who someone is, their identity. And once you do Personal that, extinction. Yeah. yeah, they're done. So he said, you have to be really careful when you're doing like I would be doing, like I would be out doing what he's doing. But he said that you have to be really careful with those, with those things because you're dealing about people's lives. You know, I was like, this, you know, you're right. You know, we well, all and I would that, say in Terry, everything this girl had been, had been or believed she was up to that point. Well, interrogation, you you take people right to the edge of that. Chase, you say all the time. It, I, when we yell at someone, yelling is the kindest thing you can do when it comes down to personal extinction and taking a person and showing them the edge and showing them that you can tear up what they are. That's how you get the hard-nosed interrogation across the line. It's not the screaming and yelling. It's that psychological piece where you get inside their head. And for a different reason, you can't do that on TV. You, you, that can't be your entertainment for people you, that's that's horrific yeah mm -hmm. horrific I, horrific i tell you that's somebody's got to be on <laughs> well and, right. and actually to your earlier point chase that that is there is some similarity between that if you were to do that greg and the america's got talent area yes. which for me has always been like a victorian bedlam where in victorian times they had they had mad houses and they put anybody with a mental illness in that house and you could buy a ticket to go and watch the people in there and the victorians would show up they'd be all dressed up and like let's let's watch some some crazy people um and oh and for God. me sometimes that yeah for me it's pretty horrible yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, but that was entertainment back then um and and for me it's similar with some of the talent shows i go hang on what you've actually done is brought in somebody who really has some kind of mental condition and you've and you said go on sing a song then uh and then and we we the audience sit there i always felt like i'm i'm this is a bedlam this is this is victorian what's yeah, going on really good thing we've evolved now to stuff like <laughs> we just watch yeah. it on tv instead of going in person yeah. <laughs> there were hard drives in the computers uh, and you took those out took when those you out. left to come up here why she, did you do that? She took hard drives out of my truck. 
that were my personal drives that I had taken. So you uh, drive around with hard drives? Yes, sir. Now, when Houston PD contacted me, I told them that I took the drives. Well, you said you would show them to me when yes, I came Yes, yeah, I have today. the drives. Do you have them here? Yes. Can we, can we look at them? Yeah, I'll bring them to you. One yeah, second. No, I don't have them because he still has them. He's still copying them. Okay, well, you can come back. Okay, sorry. Yeah. I thought I already, he brought them back, but he didn't. I thought I did, I, but I forgot. Okay, so you don't have them? I don't have them. But so he, where are they? They're at a friend's house here in Odessa. He's an IT professional, and he's the one extracting the information for me so that the drives remain in the state that they should be so that the police can investigate. You, you said you were going to show those to us, and you got up and walked to the door and then said, oh, that's right, they're not here. But not 15 minutes before we got here, you told my producer they weren't here. You already knew they weren't here when you got up to go get them. My mind is scatterbrained right now. I mean, I, I forgot. All right, Chase, what's your number two, dude? I think uh, number two would have to be Jody Arias. And I think Jody Arias was such a good episode because that's where we really got to, to dive into the concept of the punishment question. And it's such a great question because it applies so universally and like the standard uh, textbook example of a punishment question is what do you think should happen to the person who did this? Now, if you want to really sexy that up and like put all the bells and whistles on it, you build up the anxiety first by saying like, uh, Jim, uh, I actually really like you a lot. So I just want to tell you this. I want you to think very, very carefully before you answer this question. What do you think should happen to the person that did this? And well, just before you answer, know that they're bringing in a lot of evidence right now that I haven't even seen yet. And a lot of stuff is about to come out. So I want to give you a chance to think before you answer this. So kind of like build all the anxiety up around it. That question is so powerful that it works on adults. It works on children in corporate environments. And that was just kind of a controversial episode that we did. I don't remember what our behavioral verdict of opinion was, but uh, I loved recording that because it was kind of a, just a masterclass episode. I think she did it as well. That's what you know. That what we decided, or that what, what most of us thought anyway. And I say most of us because who knows? I don't even remember who she is. I, I don't I think have, she cares. I, I, I don't think she remember Jody Arias. I do the, the blonde hair. Remember the blonde hair stabbed, shot, killed her her boyfriend the in, in the, the shower. shower. But here's the the interesting piece for me. I don't think she'd care if you ask her a punishment question as long as you say Jody, as long as you call her name. I think she's. Just if you remember, she, I think she's got some borderline personality thing going on along with it, some other stuff. But she that she had no compassion for any human being when you watched her. Remember, she's the one that was putting her checking her makeup. How do I look? How's my hair before the interview? So it's right. all about that image and that person there. You can't miss those pieces, man. Oh, she's going to be upset then that I can't remember. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And get some mail. <laughs> she's the one that stood on her head right. in yeah. the interrogation room. You remember? Right. Right. We do. We've never looked at. We've never looked at that interrogation, and people have asked us to. Uh, I think we did look at pieces of the parts of it. Standing up. We've never looked at the standing on the head moment. I'm pretty. Oh, not that. I'm take. pretty sure no. we should maybe look at that. Sometime. No, it's, it's a good one. We could go back and look at her again. She's got so much stuff in there. But we had such good video of her saying, for example, um, it, "How's my hair? How's my makeup?" Just That's before she went on checking her lips, doing all that kind of stuff in an orange jumpsuit. So. Yeah. I thought that was at, at the same time. I thought that was her trying to be part of something, you know, because she's she's in prison or in jail at that point. So I think, or I guess prison at that point. So I think she's trying to be part of something. So here we're all doing this together. Do I look okay? What's it? She's trying to connect. I kind of I didn't feel sorry for her there, but I saw her being a human there. So when you wanting to be part of something, you know. Why didn't you apologize to them? I did apologize to them. You never said I'm sorry. I said that I'm sorry, that I'll never be able to make up for what I did, and that I can never replace their loss. But you didn't use the word I'm sorry. Well, then I'm sorry I didn't say that, because certainly I am sorry. I think, in a sense, the words I'm sorry just seem meaningless, especially since nobody believes what I'm saying anyway. You said it right there, no one believes a word out of your mouth. Why do you keep talking? 
Well, um, because I know that I'm not just, I've lied before, that doesn't mean that I'm a liar by definition, by character. What do you think of this jury? It's pretty clear they don't think too much of you. I wonder what you think of them. Um, I don't know. I feel, I feel a little betrayed by them. I don't dislike them. I just was really hoping that they would see things for what they are, and I don't feel that they did. To a lot of people, they think this switch from I want to die to now I want to live is just another lie from Jody Arias. Well, I don't know what that means. Was I lying when I said I want to die, or was I lying when I say please spare my life? You know, um, whatever happens, I'm just going to take it and deal with it. You said today you want to give Travis's family closure. You know they want you dead, so why don't you give them that closure? Well. What do you mean by that? Why don't I kill myself? Is that what you're asking? No, why don't you accept the fate of the death penalty if you know that's what they want? If you truly care about their closure? Well, I've caused them a lot of pain. I've caused my family a lot of pain. And I think that by asking for death, I'm only going to cause more pain to my family. If you were on that jury and you had heard what they have heard, would you kill you? I don't believe in capital punishment, so the answer would be no. For now, Arias is sticking by that story the jury didn't buy. That she's an abused woman who killed in self-defense when Alexander lunged at her from his shower. So you really are never going to tell the truth about what went down in that bathroom? I don't know what you mean by that, because I've told the truth. I didn't know that you were a hater when you came to interview me. I, I'm not and that was about as angry as Arius got. She stayed composed throughout, if not occasionally smug. Uh, Mark, what's your number two? Uh, number two, Stephanie Lazarus. So do you remember her? Oh, yeah. Um, Ex-detective. I think she made... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the whole, so it, it's, it's an example of um, Olympic-level extreme turtling. I mean, just extreme. <laughs> and, and extreme grinching, as I'm now going to call it. It is like Jim Carrey uh, has shown up to this. But what, what's, what's great about it, for me, again, it's another example of you can have some status. This is an ex uh, police detective. She maybe is a police detective at this time when she's yep. being interviewed, I think. Yeah. Yep. So yep. you might think, OK, well, then she's going to know what to do in interrogation. She could beat this. Um, you know, she she knows what's being played. on. Well, no, she stands no chance. Her behavior goes absolutely extreme off the charts just because of the pressure. I mean, maybe there's an argument that says it's even more pressure because she knows what's going on. She knows the stakes uh, going on. So, so maybe she goes out of out of anybody's baseline, out of any any rational human being's baseline, other than Jim Carrey. I mean, if you were if you're Jim Carrey in this situation, you'd do exactly that, and it would be a brilliant performance and we go isn't Jim Carrey amazing just so happens she's not Jim Carrey so you, you really can't do what she's doing in this uh in this situation again another example of whoever you are under the right pressure you can't escape delivering um let's call them tells you know delivering uh um behavior which is outside of not only your norm but everybody else's norm uh, as well. Ch Chase, do you, re do you remember this one? Yeah, it was, it was a perfect example of watching somebody who's probably had some training in interrogation, who's dealt with criminals before, who, who everybody would expect, you know, they know how to handle themselves and they know how to do it. And Greg, you may disagree with me, but there is no amount of training that vaccinates you from being vulnerable to interrogation tactics. If you have a good interrogator, then I, you could watch all these episodes and see people in the comments sometimes saying, well, you know what? You're training people how to lie better. You're training people how to do this. No, that's not how that works. Interrogation leverages mammalian responses, not the human stuff. And good interrogation leverages uh, lower part of the brain stuff that is programmed into us since birth, not just the little linguistics and stuff. So it's like trying to like affirmation your way into being 
something completely different than you are. It just doesn't work like that. And I think that def- that episode definitely showed that once the limbic system turns on, unless you've like your interrogation training has happened over the course of 20,000 hours of doing that stuff, that's gone. It's out the window. Unless you've done tons and tons of repetitions in rehearsing for that scenario, all your training uh, goes down the drain. Greg? Thanks. Chase, to your point, yeah, because I'm, I'm a resistance guy. I've taught tons of people to resist interrogation. And you know how we teach them? We don't teach them to intellectually overcome the interrogator. We train the limbic brain. We put them in limbic response, and we teach that. So the, it's shadowy. Chase, you, if I ask you what happened in Seer, you even the stuff you could divulge, you will barely remember until you get back in the situation. Then your brain will come up. What happens, and Mark, you're dead on, what happens with this with this person. I, I went through Sears school after having worked there. So I knew what was coming. You think I could fight it, but you couldn't because your brain doesn't work that way. We go in and we think, well, I'm going to appear to be honest in the beginning. And the next thing you know, the rug is moving and it's too late. <laughs> and that's what I love about this one. It was a great call aside from the Jim Carrey stuff and the she's the Grinch for Christmas. That's perfect. But aside from that, I think it's beautiful to watch the rug move and her not realize, and it's too late by the time she starts to try to engage what she does know. Scott, what'd you say? Yeah, I I I think um in this case, it's somebody it, this is somebody who, it, that's your basic went out and killed somebody. And then like Chase was saying, they think they can I don't know if she thinks she can get out of it. Maybe in one of those things that happened during an years later. Evil. Years years later. She years later, remember? Yeah. But what I'm saying is she may have done this and and an emotional lot of people may have done the murder or may have murdered Mm -hmm. the guy or whatever. And then coming in thinking that she could get past this. One of the first questions when I first started being trained as an interrogator, one of the first questions out of my mouth was, hey, listen, what happens if like we were talking about a second ago, how can you do this to an interrogator? And then the guy said, here's the way that works. You can keep this up for a few minutes, for a little while, maybe an hour. You can still, you can battle all those things. But after a while, it starts going away. You can't really, because they're just going to change tactics on you. They'll change, they'll talk about other things. They'll get things that are for you personally. That's why it's so important to know a lot about the person uh, when you go in and talk to them, if you can get as much information as you possibly can. Because you can you can keep that up and you can use the tools we we talk about on here and teach you on here, but you can't keep it up Longer than that we can <laughs> from the other side of the table. You can't keep fighting that, you know, because pretty soon it just it, it goes down. And we saw the, the perfect example in, in my se- my next favorite one. Well, one of the concerns I had is looking at some of the notes is uh, some of Sherry's friends said that you and her were having a problem <laughs> because of the John situation. <laughs> well... I, number one, I don't know who her friends are, because um, again, I don't, I don't recall if he did tell me where he met her. I don't know even who these friends are. A problem, like I said, if I spoke to her, I mean, I'll go on as far as a limb, and I don't even want to say I spoke to her five times because that's probably not even true. I, I, I can't even remember. Um, again, did I meet him at her plate when he, you know, he lived on Roscoe for I think. Uh, quite a while but I couldn't tell you how long he lived on Roscoe and the only reason I remember the place now is because it's like a huge dope dope place now where they you know it, it may have been back then but you know maybe we didn't know back then um I could have met her there I could have you know uh. a Russell Williams and Jim uh, Smith mm, the perfect uh, yeah. interrogation because you've got somebody that under, that's been through a lot of stuff He's, he understands interrogation he understands all these things and Jim Smith goes in and just, I, it's still when I watch that, and I watch it every now and then, even though he came on here and explained it to us and said, here's how, you know, here's what was happening, here's what was going on. Still, it's so, it's like artwork. It was like, a, it was like watching like watching an artist do that, you know, paint something or create something. It was wonderful because we we got to see not only the what, what we would be thought the impossible to happen, we saw it happen so elegantly and so smoothly, how he approached that. And he, and he came out like he was an accountant or something. You know, it's just like, hey, and really, but he 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 never 
went in like, oh, well, what about, you know, we, we always see on TV and the movies, we always complain about this on here. They go, where's the girl? Where's the chat? Where's the this? Where's that? None of that. It was all, you know, hey, so did you ever think about so-and-so? What about this? What about that? He did it perfectly, perfectly, I thought. That's, that's. That was a fight between my my number one and and the number two on that that I chose. Greg, what do you think? Yeah, uh, one of the things that I want you to always hear, and you can find me being an absolute jerk on a couple of TV shows where I get to be the heavy, so the guy coming in behind me wins. You win with trust, and that's the perfect example. And I always say the bad guy can always make the other person more trustworthy. So when we do that kind of thing, when you hear fear up harsh, when we talk about U.S. Army accepted interrogation techniques. Those things are intended to be choreographed or orchestrated is the term we would use with another approach and another person. Once you go in and scream and yell, the next person is the person they're going to talk to, not you. It doesn't work that way. It always works that the person they trust, they divulge information to. And so it's a powerful tool and we get to see it work really well in that one. I think the most powerful moment in there is he just assumes. I mean, we talked to Jim and he he said, I didn't know a lot of that stuff was going on. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. It came in late. And when he just leans over and he personally, I'm sure Chase, I'm going to steal your line here because I know you love this. One. What are we going to do, Russ? <laughs> Boom. And he goes, well, you got a map. I'll just show you where she's at. I mean, come on. You don't get a better close than that. Chase, what do you think? Yeah, that's uh, the first thing I was going to talk about is – and, and we've had Jim, who's the interrogator for Colonel Russell Williams, here on our show before. Uh, Jim, Jim is what I would call a friend of ours yep. and wonderful human being, by the way. But what one thing that military seer, and when Greg says seer uh, all the time, I see in the comments like, what is S E A R or like however they spell it? Yeah. It's uh, survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. So in the military, if you're a tier one unit or you're a four deployed gunfighter unit, you have to go through this stuff to make sure you can resist interrogation. And one thing that they don't spend, I don't think, much time preparing you for is facing the tremendous overwhelming fear of having your social reputation destroyed within a community. And intelligence interrogations are way different than a police interrogation where you're in your hometown, worried about people finding out that's all over the place. Uh, and one of the reasons that's so effective in interrogation, and Greg, maybe you'll disagree, but uh, I, I think one of the reasons it's effective is, do you think about the Maslow's pyramid of hierarchy of needs? Everything above safety is about identity. Everything above safety look at it the right way, especially in interrogations, is about, uh, you know, what tribes am I in? Who loves me? Who protects me? How do I feel about myself? And what's my overall identity? All of that is identity. And that's what he used. And Jim Smith was an expert at leveraging identity. If you go back and, and look at some of those tactics that he used. Mark. Uh, yeah, sorry. Hey, one, 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 sorry, one note, Chase everything we do is about identity it's about esteem and belonging everything everything we do even in the intelligence interrogation yep sorry mark yep. no no problem uh so yeah big shout out to jim smith i know jim often watches the show jim sent us a christmas message i want to tell you something about uh jim which is uh, amazing so um my daughter uh came to me and she said uh, dad we got to get a um i need to get hold of a police officer um, in order to, to bring bring one into school to to chat to people at school. Um, uh, so, you know, my daughter at the time, she's maybe 13-year-old student, and uh, and so she says, Dad, do you, do you know anybody who I'd be able to get hold of? And I said, yeah, I do. I do have one in, in mind. <laughs> so I send Jim an email, and I, and, and I say, Jim, would you, would you go into my daughter's school? And, and he's like, yeah, okay, great. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so, and he did it. He absolutely did it. And the and the students were were bowled over. Like the school were amazed. I mean, this is probably one of the most decorated police officers that Canada has. I mean, this is the guy who's interviewed uh, Bernardo. So, if you're Canadian, maybe if you're American, you understand uh, who that is as well, and just how important uh, that particular criminal is within within Canadian criminality and culture. Uh, so what a what a what a stand up guy! What a great uh, great guy to do that. So uh, Jim, have a great uh, great Christmas, 
and we will uh, see you around. Merry Christmas. I think you're in love with Merry it. Christmas, Jim. We all are. She, she, she did a great <laughs> job. Yeah. Russell, you know there's only one option. What do you, what do you, what other option is there? What's the option? Well, I don't think you want the cold blooded psychopath option. I might be wrong. Okay, because I don't get me wrong, I've met guys who actually kind of enjoyed the notoriety, got off on it, got off on having that label, Bernardo being one of them. I don't see that in you. If I saw that in you, I wouldn't be back in here talking to you, quite frankly. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you got me fooled. I don't know. This is over. And it can have a, a bad ending where Jessica's parents continue to wonder where her daughter's lying. And I don't know. I mean, obviously, there's a huge search still underway, and it'll continue. It'll continue until her body's found. That might even happen tonight, for all I know. Once that happens, then I don't know what other cards you would have to play. What are we going to do? Jessica somewhere where we can find her easily? Like, is this something where I can make a call and tell somebody to go to a location and they're going to find her, or is this something where we have to go and, and uh, take a walk? All right, uh, what's next? Is our number one? This is number one. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I know Chase and I had the same thing on this one. Oh, okay. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's the very first one we did, the Tiger King. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Because, yeah, because it's it was on there all all serious and all oh, you know, I usually would not think about that. <laughs> and it's all we're all like it's so so engaged and trying to be all which we you know, which it is serious business what we're talking about, but we're also it shows us at the very beginning. Uh, it was right in the middle of uh COVID. We we're all born oh, out yeah. of our skulls, you know, we we're all talking on the phone and stuff back and forth, you know. So it was uh, I I think that's my favorite one. Uh, of all of them because it, sh it it shows us first, you know, learning how to do this and how smooth it's become. And I think my my video editing skills obviously have, have come up at least 3% from back then. <laughs> a, good, absolutely a good two to, to three. To yeah. the art <laughs> well, I'm going to go ahead with a three. I've heard people say three and a half and four, but I'm just saying three, yeah. you know. So that's that was that's one of my favorite things to see how we figured out how to go through this and make it, so it's so it's easy and and be and then we decided how much fun it was how we were we, we all couldn't wait to the next week to get together that the next fun. Tuesday yeah. to do another one you know let's do another one okay we'll do another one before we decide to get, say okay let's go ahead and we'll we'll do this for you know till it stops I guess until one of us 
leaves the earth. So, uh, Greg, what, or let's like, go back to Mark. Mark, what do you think about the Tiger King? Uh, yeah. So the thing that stands out for me about that episode in in general, uh, and and Chase, I can't remember how you phrased it because you phrased it so well. So I'll 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 do my version, then you can tell me what it actually was. <clears throat> but essentially, it's that if you've got um, <clears throat> somebody with <clears throat> excuse me, if you've got somebody who uh, leads an outsider lifestyle, which, you know, having big cats, many big cats, is not most people's, I mean, none of us do that. I mean, Greg's got some horses, but that's not a living tiger. That's nowhere near a tiger. If, you, if you're leading that lifestyle, then we should expect that you'll do behaviours which are outside the norms yeah. as well. And so uh, we, we, we coined this thing of the 3 a.m. milk run, which is, it, you know, it, it, for me, going out at 3 a.m. in a vehicle to get, you know, quarts of milk, that's like, that's never going to happen with me. There's no reason uh, for that. But there's there's a potential that for somebody who owns big cats, like a 3 a.m. big milk run is a strong possibility. It's maybe even uh, probable, the 3 a.m. milk run. So it was a great kind of lesson in, in behavior that you can't, you've got to really look at the context before you judge, you know, these outlandish behaviors. Chase, do you remember how you how you phrased that? I wish I did. And Scott, maybe we can overlay it and throw it on here. That would be a, fun to see that. Yeah. Because yeah, think- it was Mark's thing. It was it was Mark's bit or bit. It was Mark's uh, then afterwards bit. then afterwards you said you said out something like outside a outside a something or other, you know, delivers outsider behaviors. Or something I, I wish I could remember what it is. We'll yeah. have to research it and find it. Just like an yeah. aberrant be easy. lifestyle yeah. itself to aberrant behaviors. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The moment you go, I got a whole bunch of tigers in the back. The moment you do that, anything goes. I'm up at five yeah. o'clock. I'm up at four thirty. We got a whole bunch of clowns coming around. We got like it's you've opened up a world that we just don't understand. We have no uh, baseline for that. And I think, therefore, to Chase's point, if you're creating entertainment via here's some doubt. Here's like you picked the right world to. to it's a great one. If you look at all the people who play in this space, right? So true. And that's a brilliant statement because anything's possible. Like, what yeah. were you doing at three a.m.? Well, that's usually when I make vests for hamsters on the internet. But <laughs> right. that day, I was I was getting some milk byproducts. Pretty yeah. standard morning. Yeah. Uh, so I think just if you. Go back and look at that first episode. You can take any 30-second clip from that entire episode, and all four of us, you can use your behavior profiling skills to look at us. Uh, You can go back and see that all of us were stiff and rigid, and uh, we, like, I remember, I won't speak for anybody else, but I remember acting like Chase, instead of being chase like so and now I'm, I'm regular chase and then like well how is chase on camera and how is chase when other people see him so i was acting like me instead of being me uh and i distinctly remember that feeling in my head where like we it was the most fun of my week but like i'd reach over there and shut the camera off and like my shoulders would fall and i was like man <laughs> why am i why does ever all these muscles hurt and it's because like we're just braced for shock i think those first few episodes greg yeah for me what was interesting is i knew nothing about that i don't watch pop well did not in those days watch pop culture or true crime and we were coming up with this whole concept and a good friend was at my house and said you got to do tiger king and i was like what the hell's tiger king and i went and watched it and i was like oh yeah we got to do this and then when we brought the thing on it's just here's a great example of somebody who has been doing what we do for a while she has this web presence and she's accustomed to being in front of a camera but it's different when someone's asking you questions and when we find all these candid pieces only later do we find out how prevalent and easy it is to actually get a tiger and we're talking to tom from the ufo show and he said hey i can get you a tiger we're like really he didn't know they're that easy to get so apparently it's a pretty big community and i think to the point you're both you're all talking about what it gave us a chance to do is to peer inside 
a community that we don't see often and to see how outlandish people could be. And Mark, it's back to Bedlam. I think if the reason Tiger King was so popular, number one, people were cloistered. They couldn't go anywhere. And now you're going to show them the insanity of people that are doing this and the infighting and trying to kill each other over something. I think it, the reason we're here is COVID. And COVID had some good outcomes. I think one of my favorites that we're not going to talk about here, unless somebody else has it, is our Christmas Santa Claus COVID. Because bringing in Santa True for that was cool because everybody was stuck at home. And we talk about it a little bit in that episode. If you haven't watched that and watch it, not on my top three. But it, I love the guy. Great, great job. That's all I had. Did I tell you guys I had lunch with Tom? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Tom yeah. Reed. Yeah. Yeah. And Tom's a congressman. Nice guy. Yeah. And a congressman. Not us. a congressman. The congressman. The one who was questioning, um, what's his name that you always say you mispronounce? The Grush. UFO guy? Grush. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Tim Burchett. Tim Burchett. Yeah. yeah. The guy in charge of the yeah. interview. He yeah. showed up and we, and we had lunch and, and listened to those guys talk about uh, what their thoughts on UFOs and stuff. It was really interesting, to say the wow. least. So, Did you get Bob Lazar in the, in the room at the same time? No. No, I don't think that'd be very <laughs> interesting for me. I would, cover- I'd be like, I got to go. And was there ever a formal memorial or, no. or, or funeral or anything? No. So, so no one... I remember the day his death certificate came. I opened the the letter and I just, I remember looking out the window and then the next time I remembered anything, it was pitch black outside. It was just like I had just completely zoned out. I don't know where I went, but uh, that was the closest thing that I had to a memorial. Mark, what's your number one, dude? Well, I hope I get through it. Wait, how do I propose? <laughs> so, you froze. Sorry, dude. Yeah, yeah. Uh oh. Oh no. <laughs> right now. That's me. That's me just just Uh oh. Is something heating up or you got internet problems? Hang on. I'm gonna pull out that connection there. I've frozen again, undoubtedly. And here I am back again. Good. Okay. You're okay. Good. The number one. The number one. Uh the number one for me has to be Prince Andrew. Uh, it was it was an early uh, quite an early episode, and and the public were were big on it as well. Uh, I I I love it. Um, I love it because it, it's a great example of it. Doesn't matter how big you are, and this person is senior senior royalty. That you know, a good interviewer, a great interviewer, will absolutely get the better of you. I've recently heard an interview with with Mateless, who should get a a damehood uh for her work on this undoubtedly she never will uh because because obviously the the those honors are given out by uh the royalty of the time uh so so that's unlikely to happen but she now says that she knew she'd got one go at this one how big this was she's got one go and she knew it had to her interview had to tread that line of of not being too harsh, but not being too soft. And she didn't know where that line was, particularly. So when you watch this interview, watch her as much as you're watching Andrew and really look at how she's navigating this, the context that's in. I love nonverbal communication and, and especially the context, because often, you know, many uh, experts in, in body language or behavior will look at the person, but they don't look like, where is that person? Who are they with? What's the space in between these two people what what's the date what's the significance of what's happening right now what's on the walls what's the what was their journey in there like there's so much around you know what are they imagining for the future of this because those people are existing in that moment but also they have a past and they have an ideal of what the future is so it, it's it's great to to watch some great lines in it uh you know um, it was just a straightforward shooting weekend. It's just, just brilliant. Uh, we now know that is, is well in the Navy. I mean, there's stuff that that is burnt into my memory uh, on this, uh, and some extreme, extreme turtling and chin tuck in there uh, of the like that we only see bettered. 
by Stephanie Lazarus, I, I think. You know, he gets close to a Jim Carrey performance, but not quite quite there uh, I, I'm, I, I'm just I just love this one uh, Greg what do you remember of Prince Andrew yeah, yeah and I'm gonna make Chase smile when I say this because the turtling was my favorite because it created that frog vocal sack yeah. every time he would do it just a big yeah. stick out the side of his neck so it was just telegraphed I love it how, how I found that video was interesting I was doing a podcast for two comedians Leaf and Elfie in the UK and they said you gotta go watch this guy so that's where we got it. And as soon as I turned it on, I was like, oh, my God, watch this. I think we had a two-part show. It was such a big thing. So if you haven't seen those, go look, because this guy, he does more chaff and redirect than anybody else we've seen. And if you know what chaff and redirect is, you know what we're talking about. If you don't, he spews information until you pick up on something other than the hot topic and then follows it. And he does a beautiful job of that. And he has so many of those one-liners, Mark. I don't, I don't know that we'll ever get away from it. It's a beautiful one. Go watch any clip from it. Scott, what did you think? Yeah, I liked it because when you're when you're doing an interview like that, or when when someone is put on the spot like that with an interviewer, you'll see him put up all these little things in front of him. All these little, I usually I call them bricks, and you build a wall. But his were more like weeds. His you have a little weed over here, and he try to hide behind this little this little stem of a weed, and he try to. Hide. And this woman goes in, and she just kind of like pulls the weeds back, and goes, "Come here a minute, let me, let me ask you this now," you know. And then he would try to duck back over. She goes, "No, no, no, no wait, just there you are. Come here a minute." Here, what about this? That's the feeling I got watching that she she got in no matter what he did or what he said, she could sneak right up next to him and make him uncomfortable. Not that her plan was to make him uncomfortable, but she asked, I think, the right questions in the right way and and got done what she set out to do, which was get as close as she possibly could without getting kicked out. So that's why I, I really like that one. It, she's not she wasn't aggressive or didn't have someone being aggressive against her like Gail King did with uh, what's his face, but uh, R. Kelly. But still, she did a great job of that. And I remember I asked Dr. Phil if we could meet Gail King, and he was like, yeah, yeah, of course. We'll, we'll hook it up. We'll see. Yeah. yeah. She's like, Hopefully she's like, no, those guys, all they do is talk about how much <laughs> they like me. That's, I think they're stalking me. So, all right, uh, Chase, what did you think about, uh, or did you do him already? Did you do him no. already? Nope. Right. So that episode with Prince Andrew, we were still beginning our channel. And for sure. I will openly admit that Mark, especially in that episode, talking about how she wore this thing that resembled a uniform and how she positioned herself in a certain way. Um I, over these last three years, have learned more to look at what is the what is the unspoken archetype? What's the story, the uh, the setting and, and subtext that's going on underneath all of this? Because it used to be I would obsess over situation and ignore all of this other stuff uh, that was part of a broader picture. And in reality, in my real life, I pay attention to those things, but I never really did on video analysis just because it's so sterile uh, that you're not there. It's not 3D. So it's harder to see that. But just the analysis, I remember it's probably in the episode, but when Mark's talking about that uniform thing, I'm like, I'm, I remember like picking my pen up and trying to like jot a note down here, like pay more attention to context, environment, surrounding like I was embarrassed a little bit, like I'm 40 years old. I haven't got this figured out yet. Uh, so that was a, a huge transfer for me of like just changing the way that I view everything. And it just another lens that episode specifically added a new lens to my uh, capacity. I feel like. Amazing. Great. Yeah, no, I'm on the same page. I, I think that was a great episode because we were just forming. If I go back and look at it, I can see that we're a little rigid at times because we were still trying to figure this out and trying to be entertaining at the same time we're trying to share information. I think it's just a good episode. Mark, I think it's a great choice. Am I right in thinking you, you threw a, a birthday party um, for Epstein's girlfriend, Galen Maxwell, at Sandringham? No, it was a shooting weekend. A shooting weekend. Just a straightforward, straightforward shooting weekend. But during these times that he was a guest at Windsor Castle at Sandringham, uh, the shooting weekend, yep, yep, yep. we now know that he was and had been procuring young girls for sex trafficking. 
We now know that. At the time, there was no indication to me or anybody else that that was what he was doing. I was in my kitchen and I redecorated half of my kitchen to look like a pretend office. Thing. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> well, that was pre-studio for me. You know, I yeah. built this place for the show. So before that, I was in an office with a flat poster board behind me. Still had it, scruffy hair. I think the most embarrassing thing we did on that first show was when we said, well, let's throw it around the room. Let's talk about our favorite body language cues. Yeah, that? yeah, that was embarrassing. Yeah. Oh, man. I don't think we knew what to do in the beginning. Yeah. So yeah, it was kind of fun. Yeah. yeah anyway. That was fun. Well, you know, on that note, and I think each one of us feels this way, if you're still with us, thank you for watching us. And thank you for getting us yeah. as far as we've done. And thank you for continuing to watch us. I'm always amazed every Thursday that people sign up, come and watch us, and take time out of their day. Thank you so much. And really quick, a lot of people watching are going to be going to holiday parties, Christmas parties. What if we each gave them one quick tip for something to look at at one of these Christmas parties as a fun game or something they could spot in family or friends, coworkers, wherever they're heading? As long as I still get to do my number one. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. Go ahead, Greg. Skip you. <laughs> Go ahead, Greg. All right, man. Yeah, so my number my number one is Anna Delvey. No better con than we've ever seen. And the reason I love it, there's a specific clip, and it's when Liam is in, is questioning her, and you watch her start to giggle and be childlike, and him start to giggle and smile a little bit, and their heads rise, and their heads come back down, and their eyes sink, and she's ready to close that con, and she knows how to do it. She's always done it the same way, mostly with men, older men. And he suddenly realizes it and backs out. And you see, I think I called her a spider at the moment, trying to get the fly, and he tears free of the web. It is the single best, in my opinion, from all of our videos, example of a con and how they work and being able to identify it and being able to fracture and break that. What did you see on that, Mark? Uh, yeah, I remember saying that I would like her at a party, since you mentioned yep, I uh, parties. It. Parties chase and and there were a lot of comments around Mark. Why would you want her at a, at a party? It, it, it would be just entertaining to have the fox in the hen house. It's just just you know she she would absolutely lay waste to, every, to everybody there. She's so acerbic, acidic, um, uh, uh, such a a gosh. Um, well, a difficult character to have around that it would be fascinating to see her live in a social setting of some sort. Uh, Chase, what do you remember of this one? Yeah, I remember uh, my notes for that episode. I still have, and I kind of catalog all my, my behavior panel notes. But I remember writing, uh, this is every aspect of personality and behavior. If you could build and design a perfect cult recruiter, so it's for somebody to recruit people into a cult, she's the ideal because she can just spin that like a little spider web around them. And that's, that's not you feeling trapped. That little thing that you've got wrapped around you is your new reality and you accepted it. And that feels okay to you. So that's the perfect personality type uh, for a cult recruiter. Or maybe somebody in some uh, weird, smarmy sales job. Scott? Yeah. Oh, I agree. I, I like this one because we got to see a, a con go to the, to the edge, you know, and go, I have cancer. I had cancer. That's the one that got on my last nerve, having had cancer. that And somebody saying they did, which I know they didn't go through all that being freaked out, being scared. What? what you, she didn't have it? She's not the cancer one. Oh, that's she's not the, the one? She's the socialite in New York who worked everybody. Oh, I thought this was the girl that, that told everybody she had cancer. No. No. no, that's Belle something. Okay, I'm hating on her. <laughs> I'm hating on the wrong person. <laughs> wow, well, Anna's, Anna's going to be super annoyed that you mistook her for somebody else. You really she worked hard to create that persona. <laughs> You're going to get letters. Wow. Yeah. Wow, yeah, well, I get lit up <laughs> over that. Uh, so anyway, so I, I, on that one, I don't even remember what Anna Delvey was doing. I don't remember any of that stuff. So I, Mark had a great transition for Chase's point. If Anna Delvey's at the party, Chase, what would you say then? What is your tip? <laughs> yeah, that would be a, a whole different uh, YouTube video.
I don't remember. I don't remember Anna Delby. Which one? Would, would, oh man, what? she is the one. She pretended to be a socialite. She claimed she had all this money. She created a foundation. She sucked all these people in, took their money, took like one girl's credit card and ran it up, burned her, all of her money, took her on a vacation with her own credit card. I remember all the stuff in it, but I don't remember what she looked like. Which one? Which one was giggly she? Giggly face. Old? Oh, young, young, giggly kind of American. Um, no. Uh, She's no, we don't know. We don't. We don't uh, know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Let me see what she looks. Go, like you got to watch it. If you if you don't remember it, you got to watch it because it's one of the best cons I've ever seen. Oh, I remember the. I'm wondering who this. That's oh Bell, yeah 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 yeah. I Bell exactly Gaddies or something is. like that. That's your yeah. I like it because it was just get to see a con in action and watch them yeah. try to weave their way through it. And I'm yeah. And I remember we just tore that up. I love that kind of stuff. You know, I'm surprised I don't remember her any more than that. I think I was just so repulsed by it. Maybe that's what she, <laughs> I've tried to block it out of my mind. So, ugh. but sorry, Chase, I, I still I, think you're, if you think I thought you had cancer, I'm, I'm sorry about that. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> she thought she had it. I had it. Ugh. $22 million private arts club on one of New York's expensive streets. It would be called the Anna Delvey Foundation and would be funded by local banks. I was working on closing a lease. That's about to be like an art center with an exhibition space. And that was the foundation that you tried <laughs> to get the $22 million <laughs> fraudulently, as it turns out. Why, from the why you seem so amused about this? <laughs> Chase, I think your holiday party idea is a great one. We should do that. Yeah. What's the you holiday party around? idea? Just, Just one winter. winter. Quick pointer or tactic that somebody could use at a Christmas party. Oh, or that home. thing. Yeah. I thought you came up with a whole, whole something else. And then right. your favorite body language. Uh, <laughs> <movement. Cute. laughs> What's your favorite okay. facial muscle? <laughs> I'm going to say it's the obicularis oculi because I use it all the time. I use them both all the time. I've got two of them and I love them. Absolutely. Mark, what's your favorite facial uh, muscle? Uh, what's my... Yeah, I, Okay, the, whatever the muscle is that moves the eye left, I don't know what that muscle is, but whatever whatever it is, that is my favorite that's, muscle. I think that's called the eye muscle, Mark. That, that, well, yeah, probably. That's the ocular the technical term. There you go. There okay, you that's go. a technical term. <laughs> the eye muscle. Let's yeah. do that for real, though. Right. Yeah, let's do I think it's a great idea. Okay, the Christmas one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like, uh, our people watching are our friends. And they just asked us, like, hey, what's one badass little trick or thing that I could do at this Christmas party? I think that would be cool for people. Go okay, for let's do that one. And I'll, I'll go first. All right. One thing you should watch for when you, when, you op when you see someone opening your present, watch for the surprise. If they really are into what, you're, what, you're, uh, what you gave them, you can tell because they won't go. It won't be a slow, oh, hey, as it, and as it dawns on. They'll see and go, oh, man, you got it. You got me. They, I've been thinking about this. This is it. And look for that Duchesne smile, the one we, we don't talk about as much anymore because we just ran it in the ground. But for Duchesne smile, uh, Duchesne was a, a scientist back back in the 1800s, and what well, late 1800s. What his study was was of facial expressions, and he's really the first guy that honed in on that we're aware of, the um, a real smile and a fake smile, the differences in those. And one thing everybody always goes to is, oh, you got to look for the little wrinkles on the, on the side of the, the eyes, because if you see a wrinkle, that means it's a real smile. Nope, not, no, it doesn't, because it's got to be the right kind of wrinkle. Anybody can squint their eyes and get a wrinkle there. So what you're looking for is that little wrinkle that comes in at an angle like this. It doesn't come down squish like that. It comes down at an angle like that. If you see that when they're smiling, then you're seeing a Duchenne smile. You're seeing all the things that, when, when you see that, how far these little things go in, to, not to get all technical on you. But when they smile, see how far, how deep these go. Make sure that goes deep. Make sure you see some teeth. Make sure that, that's, that their eyes widen a little bit as they're looking at it. And you also see their pupils dilate some. So when they're, it's going to be hard to see all that when you see somebody when they first get it. But if, you're, if they're sitting next to you or, or you can get a good look at them, look for those things. And you'll know whether that's real or fake or, or how excited they are. They may like your present or love it. But the, the level of like or love you'll be able to tell by using those things. Greg, what do you think? Let's just make it really simple. For me, the most important thing you can do is something I call active listening or talking to someone, not at them. When you're at a party, just don't do all the superficial things. 
I think that holidays can be tough for people, especially if they've lost someone or there's some emotional issue for them. And the most powerful thing you can do is listen. And when they use a word with stress on it, repeat that word and talk to them. Be an active listener. Listen with intent. Act like a three-year-old. Act like you want to know what they're talking about and get to the bottom of it. That's the best gift you can give anyone is if they're feeling some emotional situation, you may be able to be part of the salve that makes that better. Chase, what do you think? So we talk about a lot about all these behaviors and stuff. Remember that one big thing you need to be looking for more than anything else is change. So if, if you're just now learning body language or you're getting started in it, do I made the huge mistake of trying to study all these little checklists of behaviors. I, I would say you need to be a change detection expert before you even learn any of this other stuff. Here's how they look normally and something is different. Get really good at that, then get good at other stuff. That's just my advice. But uh, and this Christmas, whether you're at a Christmas party or you're watching somebody open a gift, get really good at looking at changes, not just still things, but changes in blink rate. Somebody opens a present, and as they're looking at it, their eyes that are normally focused on things they start looking at this box and they start blinking all the, all the time. You see a giant spike in blink rate. You're like, you know what? I got, I kept the return receipt for that. <laughs> Here it is. Just in case. So watch for those little spikes in blink rate. And when you're at the little family or corporate Christmas parties, you start seeing a conversation with somebody, look whose blink rate is faster than the other person's and then interrupt briefly to talk to the person with the higher blink rate and they'll be more relieved that you briefly interrupted the conversation. Mark? Yeah, nice, very nice. Okay, let me give you a, a hint and a tip by destroying in my mind what is a bit of a myth. So you're there at the party and you've read stuff on the internet about body language and you've read that wherever somebody's feet are pointing, that's where they want to be. And so you're looking at a group there and you see somebody's feet pointing, you know, let's say towards the door and you think to yourself, oh, look, there it is. That person doesn't want to be in the conversation because their feet are towards the door. Uh, I read it on the internet. It's true. Um, you know, now I, now I know exactly what's going on. No, utter, utter, nonsense what you want to look because it doesn't matter where the feet are going wherever their center of gravity is where with whatever wherever their navel is pointing towards they're going that way regardless that's where and, and this is unconsciously governed and so what you want to think about is imagine there was a little stick pointing you know, out of the navel, wherever that is pointed towards, that's where unconsciously that person's center of gravity is going to go. I don't care where the feet are going, where they're pointed. If that center of gravity moves off in that direction, the feet are following. I don't care where their head is pointed. Yeah. Wherever that center of gravity is going, that's where the head is eventually going to go. So look at that center of gravity and go, is it is it up? Is it buoyant? Is it depressed in some in some way? So are they are they are they grounded or are they buoyant? Are they up in the air? Could they have they got the right gravity to move at the moment? Do they look like they're about to set off somewhere? And where is that pointed? Where do they want to set off towards? Nice little one just to watch during parties and get out of that maybe habit you might have got into of looking at people's feet and where they're going. That, for me, is of, is of no consequence, along with uh, which way are their legs crossed. That one is <laughs> like, yeah. it's like, no, where's the navel pointing? I, I, you know? I heard one this week. Uh, I'll, I'll, you can take this out if you want. But I heard I was listening to a morning talk show. And they were saying, how how do you know a date is going bad? And they said, if somebody looks up and to their right, body language experts say it's a lie. Which body language? It takes time to get good at being an eye-reading person. Let's just not, while you're at a party this week or this month or this year, don't pretend that eye movement is an absolute and that when a person looks to a certain place, it means a certain thing. In fact, ask them questions and watch your eyes move around just to see that people's eyes move when they're talking. That's all. Don't don't believe any of these old myths. Just come back to our show and we'll, we'll teach you how eyes work. But this is not the place. 
I'm going I'm to have to go a little bit against what you're saying, Mark, about the about the feet thing. Because if someone, I, one Maybe, of the things have, I have always you written it in your book. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But here's why, and here here's the reason why. Because when someone is standing in your office and they're leaning on the door, or they're leaning on something, and they're thinking about leaving, their feet may point that way, but they're not going to point their subconsciously point their navel that way. Mm -hmm. Their feet will point that way. Their feet will point toward the door more. If you're sitting like I'm sitting now, and my feet are pointing that way because that's where I'm going to go. It's almost like you're getting ready for a um, the gun to go off and you start running. Mm -hmm. That's one thing. But I I'm under the impression from what I've read that, and I have to I can find the the, the studies on this, but it's mostly from just my experience. Is uh, the feet will point toward where you where you're thinking about going? Not all the time. But they will, they'll, they'll sort of edge toward that way, especially if you're in a hurry for something. That's what I always say. If you see someone with their feet pointing toward the door and you're talking to them, but they're like, right like this, which their body has to, to adjust a little bit for that, then go ahead and let them go. Say, it looks like you're, you That's got something key. to go do. The, the do key that, is the adjustment. Until the center of gravity moves in that direction, their feet can't go in that direction. It just, it just the body doesn't function like that. The center of gravity has to shift. And then, because walking is controlled falling over. And the falling over starts from the center of gravity moving moving forward. So that's, I, I agree. Like, if the feet are going, there may be some intention. There may be some intention, but it isn't going to happen at, at that well, point. Uh, yeah, obviously, you're not going to walk like a crab over there. But I'm saying when well, you exactly. first look, yeah. I would say that you're correct about that. The intention part of it, your feet would start going that way. And then a couple minutes later, you're going to scoot toward and go, hey, look, and then scoot a little bit more maybe besides mm -hmm. just getting up and going. Dep I mean, there's so many things. It's like the thing about body language. So many things are come into play with it. You know, that's why people think up and to the right and up to the left and down to the right and to the left mean the same thing for everybody and all that. So We're back to what Chase just said in the beginning. Look for change. That's your yep. motto. No, Greg, I mean, that's, that's what well, you say. Baseline, baseline, baseline is what I was saying. Yeah. Chase is saying the same thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, I think this is another good one, fellas, and we'll see you next time. So what do you got?